published under the authority of the House. The House now comes to the delivery of the budget. Mr. Honourable Speaker. Bill English. Mr Speaker, I hereby present the 2013 Budget Minister's Executive Summary, the Speech, the Fiscal Strategy Report, the Economic and Fiscal Update, the Estimates of Appropriations for the Government of New Zealand for the year ending 30th of June 2014, the in information supporting the estimates of appropriations for the Government of New Zealand for the year ending 30th of June 2014, and departmental statements of intent. Those papers are published under the authority of the House. Appropriation 2013-14 Estimates Bill Introduction The Appropriation 2013-14 Estimates Bill is set down for first reading forthwith. Honourable Bill English. Mr Speaker, I move that the Appropriation 2013-14 Estimates Bill be now read a first time. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion will say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Appropriation... 2013-14 Estimates Bill, first reading. The Appropriations 2014 Estimates Bill is set down for second reading forthwith. Honourable Bill English. Mr Speaker, I move that the Appropriation 2013-14 Estimates Bill be now read a second time. Mr Speaker, it's my privilege to deliver the National Head Government's fifth budget. When I stood to deliver the government's first budget in 2009, New Zealand faced challenges I think we were only able to fully appreciate with the passing of time. The world had entered the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, from which it has yet to fully emerge. The New Zealand economy had been in recession for more than a year, and some economists were predicting the unemployment rate would go higher than 10%. The previous government had increased its spending by 50% over the previous five years, and that was simply unaffordable. The Treasury told us that if we kept the policy settings we inherited, we'd never see another budget surplus again, and government debt would increase to the levels we're currently seeing in Europe. That wasn't the end of it. Few at that time anticipated how difficult the global recovery would be. And no one anticipated the Canterbury earthquakes, which, apart from the terrible loss of life, have been one of the most expensive natural disasters in history. So starting in Budget 2009, we set out our plan to get New Zealand out of a deep hole. We were prepared to run deficits for a few years, 
to support the fragile economy, preserve jobs and protect the most vulnerable New Zealanders, including families with children, from the worst of the recession. That meant increasing government debt. But at the same time, we set out a credible path back to surplus and a plan to start paying back this debt. That plan involved reining in expenses and getting on top of the long-term drivers of government spending. We also set out a comprehensive program to build a more productive and competitive economy that supports higher incomes and more jobs. This has included our tax package of 2010, our ongoing resource management reforms, the introduction of 90-day trials, investment in infrastructure, building on our inter international trade deals, and a significant investment in skills, training and apprenticeships. We've been driving for better results in public services, and since the earthquake, we have worked hard to support Cantabrians through the aftermath of their disaster and through the rebuilding of their city. Mr Speaker, the Government's plan has not involved radical change. We've done what we said we would do and we've taken people with us. And that plan, using sound and proven economic policies, is working, as international bodies like the IMF have recognised. So New Zealanders can look to the future with, with well-earned confidence and with optimism. The New Zealand economy grew 3% last year almost the same as Australia and higher than almost every other developed country. Wages are growing. Cost of living increases have been modest and interest rates are at 50-year lows. There are 50,000 more jobs in the economy than two years ago and although unemployment does remain too high and attracting investment that creates jobs is a particular focus for the government. The fiscal outlook has improved markedly as a result of the government's sound management, and we are on track to post a surplus in 2014-15. These are real achievements that are benefiting New Zealanders and their families. Budget 2013 is about building momentum in this programme. But there is a risk that all the gains we are now making could be lost in the future by going back to policies that have failed in the past. We know what these are high and wasteful government spending, more costs and more taxes on households and businesses, and more state control of the economy that chills private sector investment and destroys jobs and growth. New Zealanders were conditioned in the 2000s to believe that budgets should be about the novelty of new expensive spending programs that held out promises of economic and social transformation arranged by the government. These promises were illusory. There was no sustainable revenue stream to pay for the increased spending, and there was nothing genuinely transformational to show for it. In contrast, this government believes that budgets are about careful stewardship of public money and investing wisely in programmes to improve people's lives and to help grow the economy. In the end, it is the effective use of public money, not the amount of it, that makes a positive difference to the lives of New Zealanders and their families. Mr Speaker, the Government has four priorities this term. Responsibly managing government finances, building a more productive and competitive economy, delivering better public services and supporting the rebuilding of Christchurch. Across our programme, we are working constructively with the ACT, United Future and Maori parties, and I want to acknowledge their support and assistance. I intend to talk about each of the Government's four priorities in turn, but first I want to summarise the economic outlook for the next few years. The budget forecasts show annual growth of between 2 and 3 per cent over the next four years. These forecasts include the impact of the recent drought, which is expected to reduce economic activity by 0.7 percentage points in 2013. Low interest rates, increased activity resulting from the Canterbury rebuild and strong commodity export prices will all contribute to growth. And across the Asia-Pacific region, growing numbers of consumers will be demanding the goods and services New Zealand produces. The New Zealand economy is expected to grow more strongly over the next two years than many other developed economies, including the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, Japan and the Euro area. 
Budget forecasts also show, an, also show an improved outlook for jobs and for wage growth. As a result, household disposable income is forecast to rise by almost 20 per cent over the next four years. The current account deficit is forecast to rise gradually to over 6 per cent of GDP in the next few years, driven by stronger investment by businesses and households, including investment in the Canterbury rebuild. If the investment in the rebuild is excluded, the current account deficit remains below 5 per cent of GDP. New Zealand's net offshore liabilities will worsen slightly as insurance payouts for Canterbury continue. However, national saving is expected to rise, led by the government getting its finances in order. Household savings rates are expected to retain the gains made over recent years, following a large dissaving over much of the 2000s. Mr Speaker, in summary, New Zealand is well placed. However, a number of risks and challenges remain. The recent drought, for example, may have a more persistent effect than expected, and rapid house price growth, if sustained, may place more pressure on the domestic economy. Internationally, risks for the global economy appear to have receded over recent months, although global conditions continue to place upward pressure on the New Zealand dollar. Budget decisions have been made with this economic context in mind. I want to talk now about the first of the Government's four priorities, which is to responsibly manage the Government's finances. The Budget shows that the Government is on track to meet its two key fiscal targets. We are on track to get back to surplus by 2014-15, and we are on track to reduce Government debt to 20 per cent of GDP by 2020. Budget forecasts show an operating surplus before gains and losses of $75 million in 2014-15. We are achieving this while still spending $5.1 billion on new initiatives in the current year and over the next four years in Budget 2013, funded in part by reprioritising existing spending. A surplus is forecast because tax revenue is picking up and the Government is continuing to restrict growth in expenses. Core Crown expenses are forecast to drop below 31 per cent of GDP in 2014-15, down from 35 per cent of GDP just two years ago, and then remain well under that level. The Government's return to operating surplus is not dependent on the mighty river power share sale. The share offer program effectively swaps one type of asset for another, electricity company shares for cash. So its primary effect is on the mix of assets and debt that the government owns rather than on the operating balance. Budget forecasts all show net core crown debt peaking at 28.7 per cent of GDP in 2014-15 and declining thereafter. Long-term projections show net debt dropping to 17.6 per cent of GDP by 2020-21, in line with the Government's target. This is a remarkable turnaround in the books. Projections in Budget 2009 showed, for example, that if the Government had maintained the spending track it inherited and hadn't made policy changes, net debt would exceed 60 per cent of GDP by the early 2020s. But I would remind everyone that forecasts and projections are by definition about the future. While the fiscal outlook has improved markedly over the last few years, a lot of work is needed to make the forecasts a reality, particularly when it comes to reducing debt. Taking on more debt has been appropriate to support the economy and cushion New Zealanders and their families from a number of major shocks, including the recession, the global financial crisis and Canterbury earthquakes. And as a percentage of New Zealand's GDP, our level of debt is still well below most of the countries we typically compare ourselves with. But in dollar terms, net government debt is still rising by around $130 million a week and is expected to reach $70 billion in 2016-17, which is the equivalent of around 15000 for each and every New Zealander. 
As households around the country know, carrying substantial debt is neither comfortable nor financially prudent. Annual interest payments on our debt will this year cost about as much as total spending on the police, early childhood education and the unemployment benefit combined. A sizeable debt also risks keeping interest rates and the exchange rate higher than they otherwise would be and in turn crowding out the internationally competitive sectors of the economy. So the government is firmly focused on capping, then reducing its debt. And alongside debt reduction, future surpluses will also give us more choices. These choices will include, for example, investing in public services, reducing costs on businesses and helping families get ahead. Mr Speaker, three key changes have been made to the government's fiscal parameters. First, operating allowances for new spending have been slightly adjusted. The operating allowance is $900 million in Budget 2013, compared with the $800 million signalled in the most recent Budget Policy Statement, and it will be $1 billion in Budget 2014, compared with $1.2 billion in the BPS. From 2015 onwards, operating allowances will grow by 2 per cent per budget. This change to future allowances will mean bigger surpluses and a greater ability to pay down debt. In addition, new capital spending in this and the next three budgets will continue to be funded from the Crown balance sheet, including from the proceeds of the Government's share offer programme. Second, the Government intends to delay contributions to the New Zealand Super Fund until the long-term debt target is reached, that is, until net debt is no higher than 20 per cent of GDP. This means Superfund contributions are now expected to resume in 2021. This is two years later than was projected in the most recent half-year update, but it is the same time as was expected when contributions were initially suspended in Budget 2009. I want to stress that this change in no way affects New Zealanders' entitlement to New Zealand superannuation, either now or in the future. The choice for the government is whether to use future cash surpluses to reduce debt to more prudent levels or whether to put money into world share markets while holding higher debt. The first option is clearly more responsible. Third and finally, the government is now satisfied there is scope for significant reductions in ACC levies. I will outline these proposed changes in a moment. The impact on the government's books, however, is to reduce total Crown revenue and therefore the total Crown operating balance. This has already been built into budget forecasts. Mr Speaker, I now want to turn to the second of the Government's priorities, which is to build a more productive and competitive economy that supports higher incomes and more jobs. The Government's plan for building a more productive economy is set out in the Business Growth Agenda. This focuses on six key elements that businesses need to grow. Access to export markets, innovation, infrastructure, skilled and safe workplaces, natural resources and capital markets. Each of these areas involves government investment and regulation. And with regard to the second of these, I acknowledge in particular the contribution of Regulatory Reform Minister and ACT Party leader John Banks. The Budget adds a number of new initiatives to the Government's existing agenda. In particular, the Budget contains $100 million a year internationally focused growth package. This growth package acknowledges New Zealand's need to pay its way in the world through increased trade and investment, which in turn creates jobs and opportunities for New Zealanders. The largest part of the package is a $200 million boost in funding over four years for science, innovation and research. This extra funding will be invested in expanding current business R&D grants, as well as establishing a new repayable grant for start-up businesses to assist them to become investment ready. There is also new funding for the National Science Challenges and the Marsden Fund. The internationally focused growth package also provides a significant boost for tourism, as the Prime Minister recently announced. The Government will invest $158 million over four years to attract more visitors to New Zealand, particularly high spending visitors. This includes funding to attract high-end visitors from emerging markets and funding to attract international business events to New Zealand. The growth package also includes additional funding of $40 million over four years to market and promote 
New Zealand's international education sector, which already contributes more than $2 billion to our economy each year. Mr Speaker, when the Government took office in 2008, we were confronted with significant financial problems at ACC, and we took action to rebuild its long-term sustainability. That's right. The Government is now satisfied that That's there is scope for significant and sustainable reductions in ACC levies. What a mess. We have therefore made an allowance for levy reductions of around $300 million in 2014-15, Final figures will be determined after ACC consult consults on levies later this year. ACC's improved performance and an ongoing review of its funding policy mean the Government has also allowed for levy reductions to increase to around $1 billion in 2015-16.